introductions first. I am Rupa. I head the Sustainable Banking Unit for Anderson Bank. Uh, I have with me Neeraj Shah. Uh, Neeraj Shah has about uh, 30 years of experience. Uh, he's also a colleague in Anderson Bank and currently heads the global clients and institution business of the bank. Welcome, Neeraj. We are here today to discuss the net zero ambitions of corporate India and how they are coping with the transition. Close to two years ago, India announced in COP26 that we will be net zero by 2070. And that followed a spate of announcement by Indian corporates, both public sector and private sector corporates, each one announcing their net zero goals. While this happened across industries, as we know, the hard to abate industries such as steel, cement, oil and gas, have a very tough task ahead of them. And we wanted to deep dive into some of these sectors uh, together with our clients. So today, uh, this is the endeavor, and we have with us two such uh, champions of uh, net zero transition in the corporate sector. Uh, le let me welcome them on stage. Uh, Mr. Prabhu Dacharya. Please, a pleasure to have you, sir. Uh, Mr. Prabodh Acharya heads sustainability for the JSW Group. Uh, he manages sustainability across uh, steel, energy, cement, paints, and their infrastructure businesses. He has more than th three decades of experience in the field of climate change. And uh, he is a very well-known face in the space of sustainability all over India. Welcome, sir. Uh, we also have with us Mr. Piyush Jha. Welcome, Piyush. Uh, Piyush, heads, <laughs> Piyush heads climate and sustainable finance for Tata Steel Group and is responsible for financing and reporting sustainability across the Tata Steel Group. Uh, he is also interested in policy development and he has rich experience working in the UK market as well as in India. Welcome, uh, Piyush. Look forward to very interesting conversations with both of you all. So uh, I'd like to kick off the discussions, uh, uh, you know, talking about the steel industry overall. We all know that, you know, this sector is poised to double its capacity over the next 10 years from where we are today. And on the other hand, we also know that it is contributing significantly to emissions, 10-12%, if I am not mistaken. So how does one balance this? You know, on the one hand, you have a very high growth. And on the other hand, you have a continued problem in terms of emissions. So can the sector ever become uh, net zero? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rupa, for the questions. And first of all, I would like to thank Indus Bank for, uh, you know, inviting me to be part of this discussions with the bankers. Because I believe uh, for everything what industry does or as a person we do, we are motivated by one factor, that's the money. So even I am a sustainability professional uh, by my choice and uh, doing this for the last 30 years, I am absolutely convinced uh, that if uh, money is not involved, the sustainability is also not going to be sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> well said, sir. <laughs> so, uh, and, and with that, let me answer the very difficult question you have asked that, uh, will ever steel sector have to achieve net zero? And that is exactly the conundrum is how we balance growth with emission reductions. And that is where, uh, to answer your first question, I will tell absolutely yes. Why steel sector? Every sector has to be net zero. The question is not uh, whether steel sector and the rest of the industrial sector are going to achieve net zero, because it, it will be, it is now an existential issue for human mankind to achieve net zero and to remain within 
2 degree I would say, 1.5 degree, I don't see it is plausible. So therefore, uh, uh, if we have to exist as a species, we have to achieve it. So there is no choice. The question is not if we can achieve, question is that when we can achieve and which sector when it can achieve. And that is what I have a philosophy and I have understanding from last 30 years is that even of late in the last three years, the climate science is changing so fast and the urgency is changing so fast. Uh, and we are no more, by the way, in the climate change of global warming, we are into a global heating phase. Uh, so therefore, the pressures are going to increase more. Uh, but at the same time, different regions of the world, even in the same sector, will achieve the net zero in different time phases. It is very unfair to provide the same carbon budget going forward without looking at the history. Please don't think that I am from Indian government telling about CBDR principles, but I sincerely believe that equity is only possible when you look both past, present and future. So you just cannot look at the future and tell everybody has to be net zero by a particular year. That's not feasible because everybody has a growth aspiration. We as a country has a growth aspirations. Now, if the answer whether steel industry can achieve a net zero, and my answer is yes. The next question is when it can achieve, and there my answer is different region will have different time frame to achieve. Now let us come back to the India. Now question, I think that is what your implied question, is that when it will achieve in India? Now to answer that we need to understand how steel is being made globally and in India. What's the difference? If you don't understand, we'll not be coming to a realistic, realistic position. Uh, globally, steel almost three-fourths is coming from iron ore to iron and then you make a steel. One-fourth is take the scrap, melt it and make the steel, which is the circularity. But in India, if you look at, we are little uh, in the higher side by using iron, iron, iron ore, reduce it to iron and then make the steel. And the reduction happens mostly by using coal and that's the culprit. But that's our strength also. We have more iron ore. The problem is having quality bad. Same time we don't have much coal which is required for the steel industry, we are importing. So we are also, in a sense, will be driven to reduce the coal because it will reduce the uh, imports. To achieve that, what is available right now? And if you look at what is the announcement made by all the big players and what's happening in the steel industry in India. As, a, as the economy is growing, uh, by the way, just to give a GDP figure, globally steel industry contributes around 0.7% of global GDP. But in India it is 2%. So it's quite uh, significant. Same time steel is a fundamental for the economic growth and there, that is the reason when we are growing we need more steel. Uh, but look at the announcement, what is made for all the big players. It's all growth is going to happen in so-called grey way of making steel. What I call grey means it is taking iron ore, converting to iron and making it to steel. Which is otherwise known as something you might be familiar called BF, BOF root. That's going to grow. But if you would have observed carefully, of late, even the most polluting way of making steel is converting the iron ore in a DRI by using coal. Right? That is also increasing in India. We don't really talk about it. We always billionized <laughs> or, or put the spotlight on BOF. Uh, but that's what is going to happen. If that is going to happen, then our focus as a steel maker has to how we can efficiently decarbonize this process. Because there is no runaway from the fact that India can make 300 million ton of steel with scrap. We have hardly around 25 million ton of scrap, so we can't make it. So therefore, it has to be in that way. 
So then how efficiently we can do and that's going to take little time. That is what we know it's going to happen. Maybe another 10, 15 years the focus will be reducing the intensity. But let me very blunt and clear here. The absolute emission from the steel sector in India is going to increase and it is going to at least double. So when we say that we want to decouple the steel industry growth with emission growth, please note it is the intensity reductions. But we are going capacity improving so the absolute emissions is going to increase in the mid time if you look at net zero target for the india is 2070 i see that is a plausible situation and scenario where possibly steel industry in india can reasonably achieve that but it is very difficult even 2070 is very difficult uh, when we say net zero it is plus minus balancing to zero that doesn't mean steel sector will have no emissions so that is another fact i just wanted to made clear, clear here. Now if I go beyond, if you look at uh, India's uh, projections for coal consumption growth, is going to peak around 40-45, right? Uh, I can possibly talk about next 10-15 years what definitely can happen in steel industry and I am pretty confident there will be significant reduction in the intensity of the emissions. Beyond that, it will be anybody's guess. I don't have a crystal ball. So to answer you, if steel industry is capable of achieving a net zero around 2070, I think it is possible, it is feasible, but it is not easy. Very clear, sir. Piyush, your thoughts on this? Yes. So, yes. Uh, so I absolutely agree with everything that he has said. And I'll just like to add a slightly different perspective. So these are the challenges that we, we, we need to wait for a time. And somebody would ask why. Why do you have to wait till 2035 or 2040 before you do deep decarbonization? Why is it that you have to use coal? And the answer is that coal-based steel making is the cheapest form of steel making at this point of time. It is the most cost efficient way of making steel at this point of time. Now put yourselves in the, or, or I'd like to put myself in the shoes of uh, a banker. So you, or, or shoes of an investor. So you are, you got, you got uh, your investor's money that uh, uh, you would put in a steel company or a project of decarbonization, or you got your uh, depositor's money that you will give to a steel company and you want them to be able to give returns. My personal saving, which I am saving for my retirement, I am not willing to take a lesser return, right? So return is important and therefore project has to be or investment has to be viable and that is where the critical gap is. A lot of stuff that I am quite sure uh, we all read about, one can make steel using the DRI route instead of coal, one could use uh, cleaner fuels, uh, relatively cleaner like natural gas or even eventually green hydrogen. Forget the availability of it for a time being which is an incredible challenge in itself but at this point of time and for the foreseeable future it will be more expensive. Therefore, uh, you, can, you can see from a market perspective that, un that somebody has to pay for it. Somebody would be either a customer and so therefore you, me, everybody will have to pay for, pay, create a toll or, or our infrastructure growth of the country would be more expensive. Is that something that we want? We have to answer these questions. Or otherwise, uh, if the customer doesn't pay for it, the taxpayer will have to, have, will have to pay for it. Again, as, as, as each of us citizens of India are willing to do that. So the point is that this, this tension of trying to do it early, which is a noble endeavor, but making sure that uh, uh, the, the, the other SDGs of the nations are adequately addressed needs to be managed in a way and the timing needs to be done in the right way to achieve the right objectives for the nations, for the countries, uh, for, for the companies themselves. If we don't do that, uh, then we uh, sort of, uh, so we end up in a situation in some ways that you yourself set out a set targets which are either going to be detrimental for yourself or so difficult to achieve 
that they tend to become irrelevant. So if somebody says, do it by 2030, net zero, we'll all laugh away and go, go about doing our business. So appropriate timing of those, those, those targets, appropriate pathway is effective, or is essential to have an sort of effective strategy behind it. Otherwise, it becomes a pie in the sky, so to speak. So that's it. Hello. Ah. So basically, you know, if I understand what you've just said and, you know, uh, I tend to be a lay person around some of these things compared to the three of you all. But clearly, so these are uh, dates or targets which are currently achievable in both your views, right? Give or take uh, uh, a percentage for uh, certain unexpected delays or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your view, do you think the government is doing enough in terms of, uh, you know, helping the private sector and industry to achieve these targets? So, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, government has two roles to play. One is an enabling environment that incentivizes the right behavior. Uh, for example, something that government is consulting upon, that's a carbon market. An appropriate, and then that's a very good instrument, a very good tool to try and incentivize transition. I think there's lots of work going around which one could refer to, which says that it is more effective than, let's say, a brute regulatory regime put in place. So clearly, some of these are what the government needs to do and is trying to do. It is very important that, that is the, it is done in the right way. I mean, I know that we all talk about EU ETS being 100 euros per ton, but it was started in 2005 and 2016 price was 4 euros per ton. So all I'm trying to say, they took their decade. One should not question whether India takes their own decade to put it that the industry get accustomed to it. So one is that like regulatory landscape, that is important, where government is, has started doing work and I think I'm sure over a period of time that should come through, come through. And the second is what's happening across Europe and we are one of the beneficiaries of it. We have got uh, in, in the UK support from the government. So that is essential to make it viable, right? Now whether that is uh, possible in the context of India, whether that is the right instrument in the context of India, one needs to discuss. But one thing is very clear, in absence of that, early, so it, as, as I said, timing is critical. If you want to decarbonize, you put it in a regulatory framework and then you get it in a uh, sort of point of time. Now you want to bring it forward, you need to incentivize in some other form. So you want to bring it forward by 10 years, support the transition. Now whether that is appropriate for India or not is a question one needs to answer. It goes back to taxpayer paying, uh, paying so, for it. Uh, so Piyush, if I can just pick up on what you just said, uh, Europe's uh, whole policy about CBAM. So what has been the impact of that or how do you see that impacting Indian exports? Is there a significant impact for the industry because of that? So again, CBAM needs to be seen holistically. CBAM is a corollary to a carbon market, a carbon market that has been in place and now become increasingly become penal. So uh, if you look at uh, between 26 and 2035, steel industry, so, so carbon market fundamental concept, you emit, you have to pay. Steel is a globally traded commodity, so therefore uh, uh, one cannot simply implement, oh sorry, ask the domestic players to pay that cost if one does that then imports will displace the domestic players and that's been happening in Europe over the last several years. So the answer to that was give them free allocation which is a backdoor way of saying there is no carbon market. So that's, that was the case for till about 2018-2019 and after that from our experience I can say it has started to bite and it's going to seriously start biting from 2026 onwards up to 2035 when after that there will be zero carb free allocation. So if you are bought into the concept of there should be a cost to carbon of emitting carbon that the customer has to pay because it's buying for carbon intense good, it's using a public good. Then, and then if that cost is for, for a product which is globally traded, then you cannot have a situation where domestic players have to pay that cost and importers do not have to pay that cost. So that parity is very important. So if you are bought into the concept of a carbon market, a carbon in, in absence of a CBAM like mechanism, it fails or it would fail. Therefore, I uh, fundamentally or in principle I can see the point of it. I think uh, it will call out certain countries which have got uh, uh, 
higher carbon em emission intensity than others, but it also creates an opportunity for certain countries and certain geographies to try and take an… Uh, so, at this point of time, let us say, uh, a steel company in India is able to produce low carbon steel. It, it sets up, wants to try and set up a business case for it. It wouldn't work, right? The carbon cost wouldn't be anything significant for the next five, ten years. One could set up an export or, uh, oriented unit to try and do that uh, uh, based out of India. So it is, it is a complex problem. Uh, it will, uh, one needs to consider from this perspective that we, we seem to think that the exporters or, or we will get taxed. The reality is, one would once once the exporter or real in real 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 importer is taxed, it 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 would there it should therefore allow that pass through of cost onto the customer. So the European customer will have to pay for a higher sort of uh, carbon cost, which comes through either through imports or through a domestic player, and then efficiency will prevail. So I think that's not a bad way of addressing this. Uh, uh, otherwise, it would lead to a significant market failure because I think I might have previously uh, spoken about it to you, which is that uh, if you put a carbon cost in an European player and not on imports, the domestic production will move outside Europe where the carbon efficiency is… Nobody, nobody is contesting that, Piyush. No, so, so all I am saying is that by putting that carbon cost, they will have a… Uh, sort of perverse effect for the planet where net emission will be higher. So from their perspective, what they are trying to do, the European government is trying to do, is uh, making sure that their customers no, will pay for absolutely. everything. Absolutely. What, what I would like to understand is, what is the impact for the Indian steel industry? Is there, a, is there a, will we see exports to Europe falling sharply because of this? So, my personal view on this would be that no, it should not because what it should enable is pass through of cost of carbon onto the customers. At this point of time, European customers are not paying for that carbon cost. As long as everybody has to pay the same carbon cost, then from an adjusted for an efficiency Understood. factor, the steel price should increase. And if it does not increase, the regulatory steps will have to be taken to make sure it increases. Otherwise, the market fails. Got that. Thank you. So, you know, just talking about cost and uh, just slightly moving ahead, maybe you can take this one. How much of, uh, uh, how much discussion goes on within the boardrooms around uh, the green steel versus regular steel? Is there a lot of debate today? Uh, so, you know, maybe if you can throw some light around that and clearly what kind of technology do you think will prevail considering uh, some of these things uh, going forward within the industry? No, no, no. Thank you, uh, Niraji. Before I answer that question, I think it. Uh, I was tempting to get my view around. No, Siva. so uh, so uh, we Siva. must tell you that if you have a different view and you want to contribute, you have to just say I. You know, just just. Controversies uh, yeah. are always <laughs> welcome in panel <laughs> discussions. I, I have a contrarian view to what Pius talked about, Sibam. Uh, I believe Sibam is not going to do anything good for climate change. It is a protectionist measure and it is a trade barrier put up by European Union. Let me see, tell why I am telling. Number one, what is the objective of CBAM? And PUSG very rightly stated that it is to prevent the leakage. What is the leakage? Leakage means if you have a carbon regulation, and paying higher taxes, it is likely that the industries from Europe to move to the countries where there is no carbon taxes. To prevent that, they are pre creating an equal playing field. That's the logic I think uh, PUZ talked about. But look, till date, what was the mechanism was in place to prevent leakage? That was by giving allowances, right? It was working fine. So what made the changes for the EU to change to put a import tax? I don't really call it carbon border adjustment tax, I call it a import tax. Why? Why they are putting? What is the reason? What changed? The argument is fit for 55 packets by the European Union. They want to go aggressive on the climate change. My calculation tell by CBAM implications, the emissions is hardly going to reduce in the Europe. It will be less than 
So is it worth doing that? Right. Now, what is going to impact to we as an exporter and they as a consumer? Now, all the tax money will go to Europeans' decarbonization. Who is going to pay? Indian uh, taxpayer are going to pay. Because the tax collected is going to be spent in their country, right? So what is the benefit? So in that respect, and I'm not going to whether it is uh, meeting the WTO requirements. There are many violations, supposed violation, but I'm assuming that will be taken care because when they put a regulation, they would have taken care of the WTO compliance. So I'm not going to those controversies. But the fundamentally, I don't believe this is going to do something good for climate change. Second thing, this is not good for the exporter to European Union. Third question to answer, is it going to impact to Indian uh, producers as, pa 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 uh, as per the cost is concerned, there is expected, there will be a cost. And from 26, I think PUSG talked, told about it that it will be phased in gradually by 34 and 1st of January 2035, we have to pay for every emissions, even European producers are also going to pay. But that's going to be a demerit or disadvantage for Indian producers. We are aggressively uh, increasing our production capacity in India. Right. Uh, if we can consume everything in India, this could fine. But it has not happened any time. We are still exporting and we will be exporting, right? And that export volume will be, uh, you know, charge extra cost. Therefore, every business like JSW or Tata will have different strategy to mitigate those impacts. That's a different thing. So, fundamentally, I don't consider that CVAM is a climate change initiative which is being proposed by Europe. It's a tax. Coming to your question uh, about the technological choices, what we have to decarbonize faster in the steel sector, if I remember, that, yeah. that's, that's the question. So, as I told, the technological choices are only today, the best technology to make steel at, at scale is to use high efficiency, high capacity, blast furnace followed by BOF. That's the technology which is going to give you the maximum productions, productivity and efficient productions. To look at the carbon efficient process, we all know that using an electrical electric arc furnace melting either hydrogen based DRI, green hydrogen based DRI or scrap is the best effic carbon efficient processes, right? So there in, in when you come to Indian steel uh, scenario, at least for the foreseeable decade, I see two challenges. One is availability of scrap, we all know India is just building the infrastructure. A steel made today takes at least on an average 35 to 40 years to come back as a scrap. So that means we have another 30, 30, 40 years to wait to get the scrap at scale, at least 50% capacity or 60% capacity. So we are far away from that. That's the challenge of having the scrap. Second challenge, having the green hydrogen. Besides the cost, we all know to put up a million dollar, million capacity, million ton capacity of steel, it takes around billion um, dollar of investments. But same thing in green hydrogen, it takes three times, three billion dollar. Is it uh, economically feasible? Clearly it is not economically feasible and that is the reason why we don't see green hydrogen based project at scale in India. Okay, what we are doing in JSW, we are putting a 25 uh, megawatt electrolyzer or a 5000 ton capacity of uh, hydrogen, that's to learn experience and be future ready. But that's not a scale. The scale will only come when the cost reduces further and the good news is that in Indian industry, if you look at the big industrial houses announcing big hydrogen project, we are expecting the hydrogen cost will might come down to less than a dollar and that will be a breaking point. If that happens, possibly we see larger hydrogen based reductions gaining momentum. But will that be at, uh, is it going to at scale to the capacity of BABOF, I don't see. Because the other challenge, there are two other challenges you have to be careful of. We don't talk these things. One is <coughs> availability of renewable energy at scale and the land required, associated land required. Second challenge is availability of water. Please note that India is a water scarce country 
and this is going to compound as we go forward. The third is the availability of high quality iron ore. Mm. For the reductions of hydrogen, we need that. So therefore, these are the challenges. Um, if you ask me, is in future steel will be made only through green hydrogen and the scrap? I don't think. But will the green hydrogen based DRI followed by electric air furnace is going to be significant? I think 30 to 40 percent steel is going to be made in that route when the hydrogen cost comes down to less than one dollar. So that is one of the significant route, but I don't see happening today because if we are building BOF, BOF, BAF, BOF, we are going to run it at least for 20 years. Nobody is going to scrap it. I think the fast blast furnace made in India is still is running in different forms. Right. So, right. so can I ask a related question, you know, given all the scenario that we are discussing, what is happening in the boardrooms, like, you know, when JSW group is sitting down and discussing that's his, this issue? That's his second question. <laughs> what, is, what will determine, you know, investments? And obviously the group is investing hugely in greening your operations. So can you throw some light on, you know, what okay. all kind of investments? Yeah, that, that is actually uh, the next question which I needed to answer. In the boardroom, what is being discussed? Obviously the green steel discussions are happening. I don't think any company of the scale of Tata or JSW can afford not to discuss the future of green steel. But we know, people don't know what is green steel, right? Yeah. Uh, there are many definitions. Nobody is clear what they mean, what they talk about. The question is that producing, let us call it low emission steel. Now what are the driver for the boardroom discussions? The driver is that, where is the demand? Correct. I see a lot of customer asking, but is it creating a demand? We don't know that, right? That's number okay. one. Number two, the good thing what I really like, besides my criticism just before, is that focusing and forcing the exporter to Europe to think about producing steel, maybe, you know, that I told the strategy could be different, producing steel dedicated for the exports. Right. So that is something which is being discussed at the boardroom at the moment. But d one thing is definitely being discussed is that how to reduce your emissions. That is for sure. Whether it will be qualified as a green or not, that's a different question. And so broadly, what kind of investments does the group look at when you're looking at emission reductions over the next, you know, two, See, five look at years? If, if I, you know, for JSW, we have committed to reduce our emission intensity by 42% by 2030. That is absolutely because we know how to do it. Uh, we are not committing any net zero because we, don't, we do not know how to do it. Right? Let me put simply. But this is we definitely know. We also know the majority of my production is going to happen from BFBO. Majority. We might put green steel plants, 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, but those are not majority. So these things are facts. So with that, we have allocated more than 10,000 crore to decarbonize to meet my 30 goal. Because, you know, I don't really know what is going to happen, how the technological things are going to move going forward. So this, these are sudden. And what are the levers? One thing, energy transition. Using renewable energy is financially viable, it can be done at scale, and it is feasible. We are planning to put up 10 gigawatt of renewable energy to meet our electricity demand. And we want to run all our steel plant with the green energy. And mind it that uh, we have already declared we are doubling our capacity by 2030 will be a 50 million uh, ton capacity. So this is 10 gigawatt is a huge uh, requirement. We also know that we can improve efficiencies for various means, whether it is carbon recycling or it is beneficiation or it is using all the waste gases in the best available technology. This is again economically feasible technically viable and we we know it can be done it also help indirectly by reducing import cost of the cooking coal so this is where we are focusing fourth lever we know scrap is a uh, difficult uh, material to get but we need to build the infrastructure supply chain in advance and i know tata steel also is working on this area very aggressively 
So we need to secure those because it is not the quantity, it's also the quality is another aspect which is going to impact your productions. So that is something where we are focusing. So and over the next two years, if I have to ask, 10,000 is still 2030, but next two, three years? See, we have, uh, okay, let me tell you how we work out. I know exactly every year how much money I need for decarbonization specifically because we built up year and year and built up to 2030. But some investment, major investment can happen this year, some can after three years. See, it doesn't happen same amount yearly year. Right. And uh, this is something blueprint I don't want to discuss. Right. Appreciate uh, sir. I appreciate <laughs> <laughs> But But one thing we have committed, 1.4 billion dollar of expenditure by 2030 is going to happen and it has started happening. So, now, we have, we have already put to one gigawatt of renewable energy. So, so you know, uh, to just add, ask around the financing part, right? Obviously, uh, there are lots of investments which need to be made and that is clear, but those investments need to be financed as well, right? Uh, and both your companies, uh, I know, have borrowings offshore as well through the capital market routes and stuff like that. In your, in your discussions, in your knowledge, can you share some light around your current investors, whether on the capital market side, which is your debt capital market side or the equity market side, how much discussion uh, 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 revolves around green financing or, uh, you know, is there a demand for the, how do you see that uh, moving? So, uh, from my perspective or from Tata Steel's perspective as well, a lot of things that uh, Mr. Acharya talked about are all common. So, yes, if you look at yeah. last year what we did, last year the two big announcements coming out of our Indian operations were we are setting up a 0.75 million ton per annum scrap based facility based out of Ludhiana. We are also doing a 379 megawatt round the clock uh, uh, sort of renewable energy purchase with uh, Tata Power. So, again fairly similar things. But we are also, uh, because of our large footprint overseas, we've got a dual track going, which is again aligned with what he said which is that certain geographies are further ahead in terms of their decarbonization pathway because either there's a regulatory framework in place working for a while or there's government support available. So it's, again, just, just to sort of uh, not to dwell on the CBAM, but you'd have seen the last three, four years, there's a host of European steel companies who have announced the decarbonization project, whether it is Thyssen, whether it is SSAB, whether it is Arcel, Tata Steel in Europe, uh, Arcelor significantly. And it is not a coincidence that they have happened after Fit for 55. So there's a role that Fit for 55 does have in terms of what's been happening over the pre previous few years. And we have had to respond. So from our perspective, we are looking at it from financing, or so transition of a European entity. So the first big announcement you saw a couple of weeks back yeah. in UK, we are going to close our blast furnaces and transition to electric arc furnace based steel making because UK is significantly sur surplus in, in, in scrap. Uh, in Netherlands, which is the second large foot footprint, we've already said that we want to go to DRI and smelting technologies of various kinds. And again, sort of that's a debate to be had as to which smelting technology is better or not. Uh, uh, it's a technical discussion. But the point is that we have already said that DRI and an arc furnace of some type, it, DRI will work with natural gas and then go to hydrogen and over the next decade and a bit we'll, we'll, we'll replace that. So again, those financing discussions are of a different nature and there is significant appetite. I must say this, that uh, lenders across the world are very, very uh, sort of keen to try and finance that at least that's the discussion at this point of time. I will know better when the rubber hits the road, but that's some time away. Uh, but uh, I will also repeat the fact that at this point of time, and it's not meant to be a criticism, there is no cheaper finance available. Mm -hmm. I think uh, all this discussion that green finance is cheaper, uh, that's not a discussion to be had. because it's not, it, it is not really cheaper. We're talking about 25 basis points here or there. That's not going to change the business viability or the financeability of my project. So yes, at this point of time for such transition across uh, sort of European geographies, financing is available. In India again, uh, quite often uh, we, or I think this is a question that, it's a right question to be asked to companies like us. But there are, I think it's also a question to be asked of companies to, who do not have similar balance sheet strength because that drives a lot of financing and that blurs in our eyes a lot of these differences. 
So I think you're right. I think there is no, there's not much of a difference from a cost perspective, but probably what it does today is that it opens up a different liquidity pool. There could be certain funds or certain pockets which would still say my liquidity is only available for this. Uh, pricing may still be almost the same. So I think a little bit of an impact from an li overall liquidity pool could be, uh, is that something which you see? Or? Yes, certainly. And I think it is an important thing to consider. So if you look at uh, uh, what GSW is doing, doubling capacity by 2030, we are doing doubling capacity by 2030. And so steel industry is growing and we need capital for that. At the same time, we need to put in capital for decarbonization. So the capital needs are very, very high. And the pool of capital, therefore, uh, sort of Indian capital pool is lesser than the global pool. Then you have got your group level restrictions that start coming through from the from the regulator, etc. Correct. So therefore, it is very important to be able to access both domestic capital, international capital of various kinds. Uh, and there is certainly appetite. I I can certainly say this, but as I said, uh, as I said, and currently we are in a, all steel companies are in a phase where we are announcing projects. Now when we really get into the throes of financing, which will be over the next couple of years, uh, then we will, a lot of this will emerge. We are sort of, uh, the initial conversation certainly is that, that uh, there is, the, the, there's a keen investor base willing to invest in these projects and I do hope that that works out. So I think this is the absolute right time for me to introduce what Indusind Bank uh, would like to do in this space. We have recently launched a slew of products uh, in transition financing, sustainable loans, sustainable bonds, sustainability linked bonds, etc. Uh, would love to uh, share some of that with you, Himanshu. Hi everyone, my name is Himanshu. I'm a part of the sustainable finance team. I am proud to introduce to you first of its kind uh, concept to post issuance uh, related product for transition financing right from and that is for the debt capital needs for the corporates in uh, entering the transition finance. It is right from the uh, opportunity identification to development of framework. The bank has partnered with players across the spectrum and handhold uh, intends to handhold the framework development, verification of framework, then issuance and subscription to debt and post issuance process including monitoring, assurance and impact reporting. So uh, let me introduce that part to you. So here is the, uh, the product brochure so called, it is just an introductory brochure which Rupa is So this handles, this um, addresses Piyush what you were talking about. Essentially, uh, for the Indian corporates, what we are attempting to do is a handhold, uh, not necessarily for the mega large corporates like Tata and JSW, but certainly I think there is a crying need in the corporate sector uh, for uh, uh, understanding what the space is, how to structure a loan offering or a bond offering how to put together a framework uh, and so the bank is happy to tie up with various counterparties and provide end-to-end hand-holding throughout the process including of course participating in the loan and the bond. So we are happy to uh, launch that off today. I think, uh, congratulations for doing that. Uh, you know I happens to be part of uh, raising sustainability link finances all over the group, all businesses, including steel. So I have seen all kind of uh, products products being uh, issue, issued. And my experience has been the banks play an important role, not only in arranging the finances, but the advising also. How, what need to be done, how and when. So that part, I think, uh, is a, a very good, yes, very good absolutely. initiative you have taken. No, I think you know Thank clearly you. this is something which is um, you know uh, extremely important for us as well, right? And and you know, uh, Rupa runs this business and she can talk more about it. But clearly, it's one of our key initiatives, as she rightly said, not just for the larger groups because you know you all have you know, people like yourselves who are actually leading the initiative from your group perspective, but there are smaller companies and that links, 
into the next point of discussion which is really around the supply chain because your supply chain needs to be green as well, right? And these could be relatively smaller companies, more in the hinterland, etc., supplying different things to you. And uh, I think we, we believe that that's a big opportunity for us to do our part in educating them and providing them with, uh, you know, uh, products which could help in eventually managing what you are set out to, right? So I think that's the whole story to link things up. Well, even it is, you know, we having all the competency also, my experience has been the bank's specialist like Rupa has been extremely useful, helpful in telling that how you should speak, what uh, framework you should talk, what uh, KPI you should take. The other relations I have is that as we go forward, any financing need is going to be fulfilled through a commitment to meet one of the sustainability KPIs. It's going to be like a vanilla bond going forward. So I think it's better to do it early than wait uh, that to be mandated. Well, I think it is also, so l let's be honest, there are two purposes of why one would want to raise sustainable finance. One is to raise finance clearly, but is one also is a virtue signaling tool, right? And I think that appreciation, that uh, sort of uh, uh, conversation cannot happen uh, without a bank or, 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 or a partner. I think you would be able to bring in unique perspectives in those conversation uh, as to why this is important to you as a capital provider or an investor as they sort of subscribe to your bonds. And I think that is very critical and a lot of these initiatives, a lot of these conversations as you handhold them, as you talk about them, the value that you bring is incremental to the value that the organization would itself generate and I think that is the important thing. So I think yes, I truly do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you Piyush and we are all in this together. So I believe that, you know, it's a mutual learning process. As we uh, go on, we keep fine tuning the offering. Um, it's, it, the market is also evolving. So all four of us have a certain role to play and, uh, you know, look forward to working together uh, with uh, groups like yours, learning and um, building a better future. No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, Indusind Bank, I'd really like to thank both of you all for taking time out and, uh, you know, talking to us over here. I think, you know, uh, every day you learn something new over here, at least I definitely do. And when you hear it from people like yourselves, then it, that makes it that much more enriching. So, as Rupa said, thank you so much for being over here. And maybe we can also launch our green report, right? Uh, the green steel report where obviously uh, we've yet. had contributions from you guys as well. So once again, a big thank you for that. And maybe we can just, uh, you know, launch that report of ours as well, yeah. we come to this uh, end of our uh, you know discussion thank you so much for sharing uh, your very valuable insights uh, look forward to connecting and learning more uh, from both of you um, we have a small token of appreciation uh, if we can uh, do the uh, you know honors and uh, then uh, please join us for some uh, drinks and uh, um, coffee tea and snacks thank you Thank you very much for a lovely interactions today. In fact, um, this is the first time I found that we are having some kind of informal discussions right. and discussing a serious, serious issue. Thank you for that, making that, uh, you know, what you call mahal. <laughs> I think it also is a sort of a, a function of a s smaller focus group. So too often we end up having a slightly more diffuse group and then each, each conversation is not linked to each other. If you're just talking about a slightly focused conversation, one could feed off each other and, uh, I mean, disagrees or agrees, that's a different matter, but at least have a discussion on the same subject. Thank so, you. No, very grateful for having us, having me here. Thank you.